I'm really delighted that this group exists. So when I was an undergrad, there was nothing like this. And it wasn't even something that people talked about, let alone having a group uh, devoted to it. So don't tell the other groups on campus, you're my favorite group. <laughs> and I only just met you. Uh, but, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm pretty confident. Because I, I don't think that there's, really, there's, anything, there's anything more important that, that a group of students, or people for that matter, can be doing. So delighted that you've, that you've taken on this, this challenge. And thanks for giving me a chance to talk to you. So when Ben asked me for a title, uh, and I knew this was for the effective altruism group, I said, OK, well, I guess I'll call this talk Motion, Reason, and Altruism. But really, what you're getting is this. Uh, so this is just, it's, it's, I'm just going to do my, my standard book talk. But it's not the horrible, sneaky bait and switch that it might sound like. Because really, the, the book really is fundamentally about, I think, the questions that are, well, the more foundational questions behind the more practical, applied questions that, that this group is, is asking. Um, and in fact, when I normally give the book talk, the last part where it kind of comes together, the, the, the science that I'm describing is really about the science of altruism, the science of helping. So uh, it, it, it really, it, it, I think it really does, does make sense. Um, so, okay. but if you've heard the book talk before, please feel free to leave. Of course, feel free to leave. I think the doors are not locked for anyone. But um, <laughs> I just, you know, full, full disclosure, I'm basically going to attempt to explain some of the main themes uh, in, in, in the book and in my thinking for the last 15 or 20 years. Okay, so the three main ideas that I want to try to get across are what I call first, the tragedy of common sense morality, uh, second, the idea of morality fast and slow, and finally, this idea of common currency. I want to apologize for my, my hard cold. It, it sounds worse than it is, although it's not great, but I'm going to have to sit and have water as we go. Okay, there we are. Okay. Um, so first, the tragedy of common sense morality. Um, so, the tragedy of common sense morality begins with a more familiar tragedy uh, described by the ecologist Garrett Hardin in his famous 1968 paper called The Tragedy of the Commons. And Hardin's parable, for those of you who aren't familiar, goes like this. So you have these herders uh, that are raising their sheep on this common pasture, and these are rational, self-interested herders straight from the economics department. Uh, and, they, and they ask themselves, should I add another animal to my herd? And they think, well, what are the costs and what are the benefits? Benefit, I get have more animals when I take my, my, my flock to market, that's good. What's the cost? Not so much cost, they're grazing on this common pasture. Um, you know, the, the costs are distributed around, so I'll add more animals and maybe I'll add some more animals. And then at some point, there are so many animals on the pasture that none of them have enough to eat. The pasture can't support them, the flocks collapse, and everybody is worse off. And this is the, the fundamental cooperation problem. The tragedy of the commons is really about the, the, the fundamental social tension between individual rationality and collective rationality, or you might put it between me and us. That is, each of those herders is doing what is in his or her best self-interest. No, no matter what the other herders do, you're better off adding more animals. And yet, that self-interested behavior ends up lead, making everybody collectively worse off. So that's the paradox, and that's the tragedy. The question is, what's the solution? Well, we know what the solution is. It's, I think, morality, or morality codified into law. That is, you have some system of informal norms or formal rules that say, look, you can't just be about me. You have to do things, you have to limit your interest in yourself and, and do things that benefit other people to some extent. Uh, so you have to limit the size of your herd, even though it would be better for you to grow and grow your herd indefinitely. Um, so OK, so problem solved. That's good. But the problem is that the problem is not really solved so simply. Um, that it's not enough to just say, okay, don't be completely selfish. You have to have some concern for us, and it can't just be all about me. There are a lot of questions to be resolved about the terms of cooperation. So, how are sheep allotted? Is it, do, you, do you think does every herder get the same number of sheep? Does every family get the same number of sheep? Are we going to have collective health insurance if our sheep get sick? Can you defend your sheep with an assault weapon? There are all kinds of questions <laughs> about, you know, even within a cooperative framework, there are a lot of questions to be resolved. And that leads to this higher order problem, which I've called the tragedy of common sense morality. So I'll give you now my sequel to Hardin's parable, which goes like this. So here we have this tribe here. And they've solved the cooperation problem in the following way. They say, not only are we going to have a common pasture, we'll have a common herd. Everything's going to be in common. So we have your communist herders. Uh, and that's one way to try to solve the problem. You get, you get rid of the tension between me and us by basically saying, OK, forget about me. It's all us. 
Now, historically, we know this does not always go so well, but at least it's a strategy for resolving the tension between me and us, between the individual and the collective. Now, over here, you've got your individualist herders, your free market capitalist herders, who say, not only are we, uh, or are we not going to have a common herd, we're not going to have a common pasture. We're going to privatize the pasture. We'll divide it into these private plots, and everybody has their own herd and their own uh, plot of land. And our cooperation will consist not in raising our sheep together, but in respecting each other's property rights, respecting each other's land, and staying out of each other's way. Right? And it's not that these people are uncooperative and that these are cooperative. They're just cooperative on different terms. This is a more individualistic version of version of cooperation, and this is a more collectivist version of cooperation. Um, now, there are other ways that tribes can vary. Right? So, uh, say, well, this tribe may pray to this god and have this leader that it obeys, and this tribe prays to this god and have this leader, and they have this holy book that tells them what they're supposed to do, no singing on Wednesdays, you can't have the white sheep and the black sheep in the same pen, or whatever it is. You, know, you, make, you make up, you, different tribes have different rules that organize their behavior. Some of them may make sense to outsiders, some of them not, but they're all on the same page. And there are different practices and different rules. So you know, in, this, in this tribe here, you might say, okay, women are not allowed to be heard. But here, sure, women can be heard, or vice versa. I'm not saying that any of these particular features necessarily have to go together. I'm collapsing these dimensions into two tribes. But you get the idea that there are a lot of different ways that groups can be organized and still be cooperative groups. So now what happens? One hot, dry summer, this forest that separates them burns to the ground, and then the rains come, and suddenly there's this lovely green pasture. And both of these tribes look at the pasture and say, hey, nice pasture. <laughs> uh, and they, they move in, and the question is, what's going to happen there? Is one tribe just going to, <coughs> excuse me, is one tribe just going to destroy the other tribe? Well, that's happened. Um, if you've read your history. Um, Another possibility is that they're going to live there together. Are they, what kind of system are they going to live under? Are they just all going to be individuals? Are they all going to be collectivists? Are they going to find some kind of middle ground? Are they going to pray to this god or that god? Or everyone can pray to their own gods? What if the gods have different rules that conflict with each other? How is that going to be resolved? This is essentially the modern world in, in one goofy cartoon. Uh, <laughs> that we have the, the modern moral problems are not a, about simple selfishness versus the interest of others. They're not about simple me versus you or me versus us. Complicated modern problems are about us versus them. They're about this tribe's interests versus that tribe's interests, or this tribe's values versus that tribe's values. And the, the fundamental moral question I think, in the modern world is whose interests and whose values are going to prevail? Can we find some new set or combination of values or way of, of, of adjudicating among our competing interests that can enable us to get along in this new space. So that's what I'm really interested in. Now, the, the story I just told you is, of course, a parable. Um, but I hope you can see parallels to the real world. So one of my favorite moments in recent political history was uh, in one of the, the Republican primary debates leading up to the last presidential election. So Ron Paul was one of the, the, the Republican hopefuls. And Wolf Blitzer of CNN was moderating the debate. And he asked Paul, he said, interesting hypothetical question. He said, suppose there's a guy, they were talking about health care, Obamacare, everyone hates Obamacare in the Republican debate, uh, and suppose that there is, there's a guy who says, you know what, I'm young, I'm healthy, I don't really need health insurance, I'm not going to buy health insurance. And then something terrible happens, and he ends up in a coma, and he needs intensive care for six months, and it's very expensive. Who should pay for that? That was the question to Ron Paul. And what Paul said, being a good politician, he tried to dodge the question. He said, well, he should have bought health insurance. Blitzer wouldn't let him off the hook. He said, yeah, he should have. He didn't. That's the question. Uh, <laughs> who should pay now that he hasn't bought health insurance? And you know, Paul's thinking about his answer. He's not sure what to say. Um, in the meantime, there are these voices from the audience called out saying, let him die. Right? <laughs> Those are your individualist herders. Right? We are not in this together. I've got mine, you've got yours, you make your choices, and you, you deal with the consequences. I make my choices, and frankly, I'll make better choices than you. Um, that's, that's the individualist way. Now, interestingly, Paul did come out and say, yeah, let him die, even though he he's, you know, fashions himself as quite the libertarian in, in many ways. What he said is that friends, family, churches, this person's you know, close others, they should pay for it, right? Which I think is an interesting answer. It tells you something about, about, about America. 
On the other side, I mean, these American political spectrum, we have our own Elizabeth Warren. And uh, Elizabeth Warren sort of rose to prominence in part when this, uh, when, when, when she, she was talking in someone's living room or in the beginning of her campaign, and someone was video recording her response to this question. And she gave this little impromptu speech that uh, ended up on the internet and went viral. A lot of people were talking about, how many of you have seen the, the Elizabeth Warren video? So a couple, not many of you. So what she says is, <coughs> successful, you built a factory, you had a great idea, it turned into this wonderful, successful business, that's wonderful, and you deserve your rewards. But there's something you need to bear in mind, which is that you move your goods to market on the roads that the rest of us pay for. And you were able to hire people to work in your factory because we paid to educate them. And you were safe in your factory because of the firefighters and police officers that the rest of us pay for. So while you deserve the fruits of your labor, you owe something back to society for creating the conditions that make your success possible. And it's easy to forget, but we're all in this together to some extent, right? And you owe something to, so that the next kid with a good idea can, 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 can make his dreams or her dreams come true. Um, so a more collectivist vision. And of course, around the same time, uh, this is when the, uh, the, 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 the Occupy Wall Street protests uh, were taking place. What do the haves, the herders who have big flocks, or the herders who have not so big flocks? And then there are questions about who's moral social rules shall prevail. Which, which, which holy books, which leaders, which gods are going to say, you can do this and you can't do that out in public or, or in your own bedroom. So I hope you see the parallel with the sort of stylized story that I've told you. Okay, so that's the first idea, the tragedy of common sense morality, the idea that there's the basic moral problem, the tragedy of the commons, the within tribe moral problem of me versus us. And then there's the larger modern moral problem of us versus them different tribes with different values that are cooperative on different terms, rallying around what I call different proper nouns, trying to live in a common space. So hold that thought. Now I want to make a distinction inside the head between two different kinds of thinking, which we can call morality, fast and slow, following Daniel Kahneman. So my preferred metaphor for this idea uh, is this camera that I got uh, when, when my son was born, and I thought, I guess I should take some pictures of um, so the nice thing about a camera like this is that first it has these automatic sets. So you have your like, portrait mode, and your landscape mode, and your up close mode, and all these things. And this is what I use most of the time because it's easy. It's point and shoot, and I'm not doing anything fancy. You just take a picture of a mountain from far away, and you put it in landscape mode, and you're done, right? And that's good. Every once in a while, I get ambitious and I think, okay, I'll put it in manual mode, and I can adjust everything myself and take my fancy RT picture the way just the way I want. And what's nice about having both automatic settings and manual mode is that it allows you to navigate this trade-off between efficiency and flexibility. So the point-and-shoot settings are very efficient, but they're not very flexible. They're only good for what they're good for. The manual mode is maximally flexible. You can do anything with it, but it's not very efficient. It takes some time. You have to know what you're doing. You might make a mistake, right? But if you have both of these, then you get the best of both worlds. You can have efficiency when that's what you really need, and you can have flexibility when that's what you really need. And what I think, a lot of other people think, is that the human brain, when it comes to decision making, has the same basic design. That is, we have automatic settings, which are our gut reactions. And these gut reactions are informed by our biological experience, by the genes we inherited from our ancestors. They're informed by our cultural experience, what we've heard from other people, what we've seen. And, and our individual experiences, our own trial and errors, all go in to giving us gut reactions that make us say, choose that, or choose that. That's good, that's bad. And that's what we rely on most of the time, and that's fine. But we also have a manual mode. That is, we have a, a, a capacity for explicit conscious reason, where we can explicitly think about all of the different features of the situation in front of us and make a decision that we think is going to serve our explicit goals based on what we know about the situation and what options we have at our disposal. And so in the same way, we can think faster, we can think slow. And one has the advantage of efficiency. The other has the advantage of flexibility. Um, so I want to tell you about an experiment uh, done with, really led by David Rand, done with Martin Novak, where we try to apply this fast versus slow thinking framework to the basic cooperation problem. Although, as you'll see later, it's not really so basic. Um, this is the, the, the tragedy of the commons. So the laboratory version of the tragedy of the commons is called the public goods game. So it goes like this. 
So there are different ways to do this, but here's the standard setup. So four people come into the lab, everybody gets $10. And then everybody can keep their money or put their money, some of it or all of it, into a common pool. Whatever goes into the common pool gets doubled by the experimenters, and then it gets evenly divided among all four people, regardless of what they put in. Now, if you're completely selfish, what do you do? You keep your 10 bucks. Why? Because then you get your $10, and you get a quarter of whatever other people put in, and they got doubled by the experimenters. So trust me, if you do the math, no matter what, you're better off keeping all of your money financially, at least if you're just doing this work. Um, if you're completely us-ish, what you care about is just how well the group does overall, you put all of your money in because that maximizes the total amount that gets productively multiplied by the experimenters. So <coughs> what we wanted to know is what motivates people in this kind of decision context to be selfish and what motivates people to be altruistic, to be cooperative, to be us-ish, right? And there are roughly three possibilities. So it could be that, well, there are a lot of possibilities, three most basic possibilities. One is uh, your, your, your automatic settings are saying keep that money. It's self, just basic animal greed, right? Uh, but then perhaps upon reflection you might say, no, 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 I should be a good person, I should think about the greater good. And so your manual mode would tell you no, put more money. Another possibility is that you have this gut reaction that says I should be nice and I should be cooperative, but then in manual mode you think, okay, well, maybe other people won't do this, or maybe I just don't care about them, I might as well keep my money, uh, you know, and something like that. Or it could be that there's no tension, that people just have their strategies or they go through their reasoning, but it's not that one is more fast than the other is more slow. Um, so we wanted to find out. So the first thing we did was just look at people's reaction time. And as you can see in this plot, uh, or the decision time, uh, the, 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 the faster people decide, so the quicker they are, the more likely they are to this contribution to put more of their money in, right? And the slower they are, the, 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 the less likely they are to, to, to put money in. Um, so this is consistent with the idea that it's a fast, automatic response, a gut reaction that's saying, put your money in, be cooperative. And then a slow response that at least in some people is making them say, no, you know what, don't do this. Keep your money. Good question. Um, did these four people decide for people? Does it what? Did these four people decide Next slide. This is just looking at people's natural reaction time. But as our, as our methodologist in the audience points out, if you want to have a controlled experiment instead of just a correlation, then you should actually manipulate people's speed of processing. So what we do is we either put people under time pressure, so you have to decide within 10 seconds, or we put people under time delay. You have to take at least 10 seconds to answer this. And this speeds people up and on average, and this slows people down. And what we found is consistent with what I showed you just before. You put people under time pressure, they contribute more. You put people under time delay, and they contribute less. Now, something you might look at this and say, oh, so this means that Cooperation and altruism is hardwired, right? Not true. In fact, what we found is that this pattern, you only see this pattern in people who report that they generally trust the people that they interact with in their daily lives. If you look at the people who say, I don't trust people, they don't show this pattern. Their fast response is to keep their money, and their slow response is to keep their money. They don't show, <laughs> they don't show any, 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 any difference. Um, I, and, and, and as we'll see, this, uh, this varies across cultures. So this is not a universal effect, but this is a pattern that you see at least in some places where there's a lot of, oh, especially with, with, where there's a lot of trust, especially trust among strangers, which is not necessarily present in most societies, a lot of societies. So the study that I just described for you <coughs> is really a stand-in for a very large literature illustrating the following point, which is that we have automatic <coughs> settings that enable us to function cooperatively, that enable us to preserve the commons, to, 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 to put our money in the common pool, et cetera. And one way to think about this is we have positive feelings and negative feelings, and they can be applied to ourselves and they can be applied to other people. So we have positive feelings that motivate our, us to be nice to other people. I love you, I care about you, you're my friend, or I have general goodwill, or I am awed by the God who tells me to do this. Um, we have negative feelings. I would be ashamed, I would feel such terrible guilt if I were to keep my money instead of putting it into the common pool. And then we have positive feelings that motivate other people, most notably gratitude. Uh, you will have my gratitude if you too contribute. Uh, and we have negative feelings that motivate other people. My, you will have my anger and my contempt and my disgust uh, if you keep all of your money, especially when the rest of us are putting it. And the idea is that these 
these carrots and sticks that we apply to ourselves and that we apply to other people all conspire happily to get us into that mode where we're putting our money in, where we're preserving the commons. That's what enables us to put us ahead of me. And I think that's the, that's the story of basic moral psychology. Um, but now there's this problem. We've been talking about me versus us. What about us versus them? You know, the, 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 the herders on the new pastors and the, and the very real moral debates uh, about groups with different interests and different values. What psychology should we bring to the new pastor? And what philosophy should we have uh, ex explicitly in mind as we do so? These are the questions that I really want to focus on. So first, I mentioned that there's variability across cultures in how people play the public goods game. So this is one of my favorite studies from recent years, not that recent anymore, but still one of my favorites, from Benedict Herman and colleagues, who had people play a repeated version of the public goods game with, what's it called, with punishment. Uh, so the way this works is people play around, they put their money in or they don't, everybody <coughs> sees how it goes, and then you can punish people for playing the way that they did. So if you cooperated and some other person didn't cooperate, you can pay the experimenter a dollar and the experimenter will take away three dollars from that other person. So it's like the economic equivalent of bapping somebody on the head with a stick. And then so you do that, you play again, then some bapping if you want, and then you do it, and then it, you know, it goes on. And what Herman did was have people in different cities around the world play this repeated public goods game with punishment uh, according to the same rules, made sure everybody understood they were all quizzed, made sure they understand the game. And what he found was that in different places, you get very, very different outcomes and in kind of predictable ways. This is really fascinating. So here's what the data looked like. This is trimmed out. He did 16 cities. I picked nine for illustrative purposes. So first you have places like Boston and Copenhagen and St. Gallen, where right from the start, cooperation is pretty high. And then round after round, maybe it goes up a little bit, maybe a little dip at the end, but overall, cooperation starts high and stays high in these places. And then you have other places like Seoul, South Korea, Melbourne, and Chengdu, where cooperation starts out kind of in the middle, and then it ramps up over time, and by the end, it looks just like lovely Copenhagen. Um, here, what's going on is some people cooperate, some people don't, and then the cooperators punish the people who aren't cooperating and say, okay, fine, I'll cooperate, blah, 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 and, you know, it, 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 and on it goes. And then you have places like Istanbul and Riyadh and Athens, where <coughs> cooperation starts out pretty low, and it stays low the whole time. It doesn't pick up the way it does in these other places. <laughs> what's going on? So when they looked at this, they found something they were totally surprised by, which is this phenomenon that they call antisocial punishment. The people who were not cooperating were punishing the people who were cooperating. <laughs> what? And so they asked these people, they said, why would you do that? Well, they're giving you money and the other people money, why do you do that? And what people would say is, you know, I don't like this little game, I don't like this little setup, I don't know who these people are, and I just want to send a message like, leave me alone, I don't like any of this, right? Um, and they found that this behavior is also correlated, uh, so first of all, antisocial punishment is a very good predictor of the overall level of cooperation. So uh, this is how much antisocial punishment, how much contribution, and you have this cluster of places up here where they're all, especially by the end, uh, uh, punishing, uh, doing very little antisocial punishment and reaping big rewards. And then in Athens and Muscat and Riyadh and Istanbul, you have a lot of, you know, you see things at, at the other end. And this actually correlates with questions on the World Value Survey about things like, how do you feel about tax evasion? How do you feel about dodging fares at, at public transportation sites? And the finding is that you know, in places where there's a lot of antisocial punishment, there were sort of lax attitudes towards these kinds of things. So what's going on here? Well, I mean, I've been to Athens. How many of you have been to Athens or been to Istanbul? They're nice people, right? It's not like you go there and it's like these horrible people who just punish you, hit you on the head for being cooperative, right? What's going on? Their interpretation, perhaps with some liberty taken on my part, is that it's not that these people aren't nice. It's not that these people aren't cooperative that they live in a world that's more tribal. That is, you don't lay your money down on the line, you don't really risk anything, you don't really cooperate with people who you don't know personally. It's all about who's your family, who's your friends, who do you have a relationship with. The idea of walking into a room full of strangers that you don't know and, and putting your money down and saying, I'm gonna trust that other people are gonna do this too, that just feels really uncomfortable. And so it's not that these people are immoral or uncooperative, but they're not comfortable with cooperating at this multi-tribal level, or at least at this level where, the, where the, the person is just this anonymous stranger, they don't have some uh, connection to this person already. I think that's an important point. Um, another case, so I 
And this is a, a case where you can think of our moral machinery, our gut reaction, at least in some places, is breaking down on the new pastors. Here are these strangers in Athens and Riyadh and Muscat. They had the opportunity to make some money. They could have done it just like they do it in Copenhagen, but they lost money. Why did they lose it? Because of, of their attitudes were not well suited to this multicultural or, or, or post-trial situation. Yes? Quick question. What's the y axis? And this is mean contribution. What are the numbers? So these are, you know, it's going to be different monetary amounts for different places because they have different currency. But uh, but 20 is the maximum contribution and, and, and then zero is, is, is zero. So it's just it's just an arbitrary scale that all the different currencies were put on. <coughs> Another way that our gut reactions, our automatic settings that fail us on the new pastors is just, at least from my point of view, yours too, I hope, is 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 out and out tribalism, also known as, as racism. In the United States, the kind of racism that people are most concerned with, for, for good reason, uh, is, 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 is racism based on race. If you're African American versus uh, European American, uh, a, a classic is a chilling study by Marianne Bertrand and our own Sentinel Melanathan. They sent out identical resumes to employers. And the only difference, you know, pairs of identical resumes, except with one difference. Some of the resumes had black sounding names like Lakeisha and Jamal, and others had white sounding names. Emily and Greg. Emily and Greg are the two whitest names. And then and, and they look to see you know, who gets calls back. And the, the startling and disturbing finding is that the white sounding resumes, which are identical to the black sounding resumes, got about 50% more calls from employers. Right? So if you think that racism is no longer a problem in the United States, you're wrong, at least as 10 years ago, and I don't think that much has changed. Uh, that it's just not explicit. It's gone underground, and you see it in people's in, 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 in you see it in people's behavior, but you don't necessarily even see it in, in, in people's rhetoric. Um, another chilling example. This is the work of Jennifer Everhart and colleagues. She analyzed death penalty cases uh, where a black person was accused of, of killing a white person, and analyzed the verdicts based on the facial features of the defendant, in particular whether the facial whether the defendant had. Uh, described as stereotypically African facial features. So this person here has stereotypically African facial features. This one not, even though they're both recognizably African American. Um, and she found that some, someone who looks like this is more likely to get the death penalty than someone who looks like this, controlling for everything else. Uh, Seth Stevens Davidowitz, who now works at Google, but who was an economics graduate student not long ago, analyzed election data using Google searches for the N-word. Uh, mostly people were looking for, for racist jokes. And what he found is that there's this quite strong N-word effect. That is places, and this is an N-word map of the United States, and, uh, and places where people are more likely to be searching out racist jokes, with searches with, with, with the N-word, were considerably more likely to, less likely to vote for Obama than Kerry four years earlier. So this was 2008 versus 2004. So you know, same can, kind of candidate from the party, but one's black and one's white. And you see a fairly substantial difference about the equivalent of a home state advantage all across the country for, 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 for being a white candidate rather than a black candidate. And a lot of evidence indicates, both behavioral evidence and brain imaging evidence and other kinds, that these are automatic settings at work. So this is the amygdala of white participants looking at the faces of, 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 of blacks on the screen. Uh, <coughs> The evidence suggests that for the most part, racism today in the United States is not about people explicitly saying, well, I don't like black people, I don't like white people. It's rather gun reactions, automatic settings that just make you say, you know, this candidate just seems a little bit better than this person. I just get a better feeling from this person. Um, and so the main point is just straight up racism is really, or underground racism, I think is just an example of our automatic settings leading us astray in a modern society in which we have to get along and interact with people from different um, another, another I think, failure of our gut reactions in the, in the modern world is our, is our failure to deal with climate change. So this is uh, this this map shows recently opened trade routes through the Arctic. So you know, the businesses who are who are shipping goods through the Arctic, who weren't before, they're not trying to make a political statement. They're just saying, hey, look, you can get the boats through now. I mean, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, this is not uh, you know, some activist group that's 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 uh, making these decisions. Instead, this is just a fair fact about the world that there's a lot less ice up there, and as a result, you can get ships through the Arctic in a way that you couldn't before. Um, okay, so now getting to stuff that's 
really sort of closely related to, to, to the interests of, of this group of audience. So many of you will be familiar with this bubble walkthrough for those of you who aren't. So um, this is a, 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 well, this dilemma comes in its original form from Peter Sater, who many of you know. This version of the comes from the philosopher Peter Unger. So you're driving along, there's this guy who's bleeding by the side of the road, and you stop, and he says, hey, please take me to the hospital. I'm bleeding like crazy. I might lose my leg if I don't get there soon. Can you help me? And you think, well, I'd like to help this guy, but I just had new leather upholstery put in my car. He's going to bleed all over the place. I'll ruin my leather. I'll let him go. Maybe someone else. Maybe someone else will, 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 will pick him up. How many of you think that it's morally monstrous to let this guy bleed by the side of the road because you're worried about your leather? How many of you think will think it's fine? Okay. No, no, okay. <laughs> Next, uh, you're home one day when the mail arrives uh, from UNICEF or Oxfam uh, or some more uh, perhaps technically altruistic organization according to givewell.com. Uh, and uh, it says, please send us a donation of $200, $500, $1,000, whatever it is, money that you give either is likely to give as a good chance or a decent chance of saving the life of somebody on the other side of the world. Um, please help. And you think, well, I'd like to help, but I, uh, you know, I was going to get some new leather upholstery for my car. I think I'll save the money for that. Now, I'm not even going to try with this group because you're like the perfect group to make this not work. But when I ask ordinary audiences, uh, you know, is it is it is it is it wrong? Is it morally monstrous to let to to, to not make the donation to a charitable organization that? really save somebody's life, either has a good chance of doing so, even if you can't do it for sure, or you know, just so that you can spend money on luxuries for yourself that you don't need, is that terrible? Most people say, no, that's not terrible. They feel a little uncomfortable about it, but they don't think it's terrible. They certainly don't think you have the kind of obligation here that you have here. Um, so what Jay Musin and I wanted to do was turn this thought experiment into an actual empirical experiment, um, and to control for a lot of the kinds of factors Site. So what people will sometimes say is, uh, and this has been debated in the philosophy literature, they say, well, here, lots of people can help, whereas here, you're the only person who can help. <coughs> and so that's the difference. But then you say, OK, well, suppose there's a whole row of cars here. Uh, they could all help, but they're not. Now can you let them die? You know, oh, no, that doesn't seem right. But we wanted to try to get rid of all those kinds of things. So what we did was we took a, a version of another uh, dilemma of similar lines that came from Peter Hunger, and it goes like this. So you are on vacation in this lovely but poor country. You have your little cottage up in the mountains overlooking the coast, and a terrible typhoon strikes, and there's devastation along the coast. People are without food, without water, there's <coughs> sanitation problems, it's a mess, people are dying, bad stuff. Um, fortunately, there's a relief effort on the ground, and the best thing that you can do to help is not to go down there yourself, but to just make a donation to the Red Cross or, or, or Oxfam or wherever it is that's, 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 that's down there. Um, and you can do this, you have internet. And so there are questions we ask people, do you have an obligation to make some kind of significant donation to help the people down on the coast below? And in this sample, 68% of people said yes, you do. Okay. Different case. Everything's the same as I just described. This is a separate group of people. Except you're not there in the cottage overlooking the coast. Your friend is there. You're at home here in the United States or wherever you live, but it's not there. Uh, and you're at your computer. And your friend has a smartphone. It can show you everything that your friend sees. You can hear everything that your friend hears. And you're just as much in a position to help. You can make a donation online just as easily as your friend could. So everything you know, more or less is exactly the same, except instead of being over there, you're far away. And in this sample, about half as many people said that you have an obligation to do. I think this really sort of gets at the heart of the matter. And it's really, and, and it's clearly a case of automatic settings at work, right? I mean, you, you ask people, you know, if you ask people explicitly, well, do you have an obligation to save these people's lives? They say, well, how, how many feet away are they? I mean, you don't ask, you know, distance by itself isn't something that we normally think of as explicitly as being morally important, but psychologically it seems to matter a lot. Now, while it's hard to justify this pattern of behavior, it's perhaps not hard to understand why it would be this way. If we evolved for cooperation in groups, small groups of people, where everyone you're interacting with is not only the internet far away, you interact with people in a face-to-face -face kind of way, it makes sense that we have moral buttons, emotional buttons that can be pushed. We have automatic settings that make us say, pull that kid out of the, of the pond of his drowning 
save that guy by the side of the road, or give to those people who you can see down on the coast, right? But when it's some indeterminate person on the other side of the world, those heartstrings, they, they can't be tugged from, from, from so far away. And so we'll come back to this. But I think what this suggests is that, you know, unless you think that this really, the distance by itself really matters morally, that our automatic settings are not necessarily optimized for moral thinking in, in, in the modern world. Let me give you another example, I think, <coughs> illustrating the same point. So this is a brain imaging study done with Alatai Shenha. And in this case, we use these what we call rescue dilemmas. So you're on this Coast Guard boat, you rescue drowning people for a living. And there's this person who's drowning, you can save this person for sure. And then you get a radio signal that says, wait, there are these other people uh, in the other direction. And you can save them instead. And part of me want to know as well, how many people are there? So you might want to know, what are my odds of saving them? Maybe if you find there's this other boat that might get there first, in which case we'll let this person die in vain if you go there. So what are the odds, right? You want to keep track of these, these, these two parameters. So if we gave people these dilemmas, and we varied how many people they could save. Is it 2, 5, 10, 20, 40? And what are the odds that you'll actually be able to save them? And part of our goal, the main thing that we reported in the, in the paper, is we want to know what part of the brain is keeping track of the magnitude, how many lives you can save, what part of the brain is keeping track of the probability, and what's putting those two pieces of information together to make an all things considered judgment that takes both into account. And to make a, a very long story short, um, what we basically found is that the parts of the brain that are keeping track of the magnitude of the probability of giving an overall valuation of these things are the same, uh, same neural systems that are involved in basic self-interested decision making, both in humans and in, in other animals. So if you have people in the scanner just making gambles, you can have a dollar for sure, or you can have a 50% chance of winning $2.10. Do you take that gamble, right? You need to think, well, what's the amount? 210, what's the probability? And the same brain regions seem to be doing the same kind of job. And it works if you have people doing this for food instead of money. And it works if you have monkeys doing this for juice instead of money, because monkeys don't spend money. Um, so the main point here is that it's our basic valuation circuitry that's, play, that's representing the values of saving these, 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 these lives. The same circuitry that uh, we share with other primates and then even, even with other mammals. And I think that this ex perhaps explains something interesting about our moral judgment. So one thing that we've seen and that other people have seen is that there's this kind of diminishing return where the more lives that you can save, the less you care about saving each additional life, right? So the first life you can save, oh, that's very important. The second life, that's still very important. But once it's like 50 lives, 100 lives, it's like, it's just a lot, right? Um, now, uh, from a certain perspective, this makes no sense at all, right? I mean, why should the 100th life that you can save be worth any less than the first life you can save, right? It, a life's a life, right? However, and this fits with this quote often attributed to Joseph Stalin, but apparently he didn't actually say it. A single death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. In other words, a single death we process with our automatic settings, a million deaths we process in manual mode, right? And up until this point, your, sort of, your automatic settings have run out. Well, why would that be the case? Well, if what we're using to place values on these human lives is basically our mammalian reward circuitry, that would explain why we sort of run out of juice, right? I mean, if you're a rat, and you're making foraging decisions. Do I go for the cheap, not so great food that's right here that I can easily get, or do I go foraging on the other side of the hill for the really delicious food that you know may be there or may not, or I may get killed on the way, right? You've got a probability, you've got a magnitude, and with, with some important adjustments, the rat is using the same kinds of neural me mechanisms to make the decisions. Do I do the risky thing with the bigger payoff, or do I go for the short thing that's smaller? Um, but if you're a rat, the value doesn't go up indefinitely, right? I mean, you don't have a fridge, you know, if you're talking about food. Uh, you know, once you, you can only eat so much and then it stops being worth it. And, and, and in general, the goods in most animals' lives, they level up. Once you have more of it, it just you know, it loses its value at some point, right? And so it makes sense that the basic design for mammalian value-based decision-making is going to have this kind of diminishing returns property, where the more you have of something, the less and less and less value you put on. Now, this is not the only <coughs> possible explanation for this. But if this is right, then it's just kind of a byproduct of the way that we're thinking about these moral dilemmas, that we have this kind of diminishing returns. And 
And we're essentially using our, to put it crudely, we're using our rat brain, we're using our monkey brains to think about a decision problem that's unlike any decision problem that those animals ever, ever, ever had to deal with. And that may be the source of our, what's technically called, insensitivity to quantity. The fact that after a certain point, it just doesn't seem like it matters anymore, even though from a manual mode perspective, why is the thousandth life that you can save worth any less? So, sort of bring it home, uh, this idea of common curves. So what do I mean by that? Um, well, we started with the tragedy of the commons, and what I said is that the, the, the solution to the problem of the tragedy of the commons is basic human morality in the form of automatic setting. That is, we have these social emotions that apply carrots and sticks to ourselves and to other people to get us to be cooperative. That's what allows a bunch of me's to form a productive us. Now, if you have this problem here, the tragedy of common sense morality, the us versus them problem, what's the solution? Well, by extension, the solution would be something like this, which you might call a meta-morality. That is, just as a morality is a system for adjudicating among the competing interests and values of individuals so that they can form a group, a meta-morality would be the same thing at a higher level. That is, it's a higher order system that adjudicates among the competing moral systems of different groups and enables them to live productively as a larger group of groups, as a modern society. So then the question is, what would a better morality look like? Well, psychologically and philosophically. Psychologically, I think it's pretty clear that a better morality is going to have to happen in manual mode. If our gut reactions are about how can we be a good us and outcompete them, that's obviously not going to be, we're not going to be able to rely on those automatic settings for dealing with, 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 with the modern problem. So what we're going to need to do is think about this more explicitly and abstractly. Think about this as a kind of explicit problem to be solved as a problem as opposed to something that we just do naturally and intuitively. So how does that work? Um, well, this is the whole second half of the book. And rather than trying to like argue for my conclusions, I'm just going to tell you what they are and sort of give you a little bit of a flavor of it so that, so that you, you feel like I'm right. Um, so one of my, my favorite examples of, I think, of moral progress in, in manual mode comes from Jeremy Bentham, <coughs> who penned one of the first defenses of what we now call gay rights uh, in, the, in, in the late 18th century. And here's what he said. I have been tormenting myself for years to find it possible sufficient ground for treating gays with the severity with which they are treated at this time of day by all European nations, that is, punished by death. Uh, but upon the principle of utility, I can find none. So what's going on there? I mean, what Bentham is really saying, notice the fast and slow dynamic here. He's saying, look, I feel like there's something wrong with this behavior, and most people seem to agree, but I have this theory, this principle of utility, and I can't really justify saying that this is wrong, but what's this principle of utility? We'll get to that in a second, but the basic idea is about costs and benefits. It's, is this actually doing anyone any harm? If two guys want to have sex, what is the problem, right? Now that's a very modern way of putting it, right? That's a very 20th, 21st century way of putting it. Bentham had that same thought in the late 18th century. <laughs> And I think the reason he was able to have that thought is he was willing to put his tribal gut reactions aside and say, I know this seems wrong, but really, what is the problem? If morality is really about costs and benefits, as he thinks it is, uh, then what is really the problem? Why, why do we treat this as being such a terrible thing? This is John Stuart Mill uh, in a, on, the, uh, on the subjection of women possibly co-authored with his wife, Harriet Taylor Mill. And again, you see the same fast and slow dynamic. But it would be a mistake to suppose this is describing his, you know, after laying out his argument that women should be treated the same way as men, be uh, given equal political rights, the right to vote, educated, and so on and so forth. And then he comments, but it would be a mistake to suppose that the difficulty of the case must lie in the insufficiency or obscurity of the grounds of reason on which my conviction rests. The difficulty is that which exists in all cases in which there is a mass of feeling to be contended against. And while the feeling remains, it is always throwing up fresh entrenchments of arguments to repair any breach what he's saying is that the enemy here is not, it's not that hard to see my argument for why women should be given equal rights as men. It's just that right now, this tribe doesn't go for it. And there's this massive feeling against it, right? And the massive feeling is always coming up with new bad arguments on behalf of, 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 of themselves. So you can sort of see, I think in both of these cases, how they were able to make progress by putting aside the gut reactions of their day, the automatic settings of their day, which they themselves to some extent shared. 
and instead asking, does this really make sense? And they were just ahead of their time when it comes to gay rights or women's rights, pretty much every major political issue of their day, so slavery, free speech, free markets, public education, environmental protection, most of the, what we take, a lot of what we take for granted as being a modern, civilized society are based on reforms that Bentham and Mill fought for in their day. Um, so how did they get so good? I think that what they did was they found a common currency. What do I mean by that? Well, they said, well, look, how do you solve modern moral problems in places where different tribes disagree? Um, well, what you have to do is make trade-offs among competing tribal values and interests, right? This tribe says this is what's important. This tribe says no, it's this other thing that's important. You have to have some system for taking this tribe's values and this tribe's values and saying, okay, this counts more than that. How do you do that? And their answer came in the form of answers to two questions. So one, who really matters? And this is the less, in some ways, is a very radical idea, but this is even the less controversial part. They said, everybody equally. So Jesus said, love your neighbor. They said, it's not just your neighbor, it's everyone. Right? Everybody's well-being counts the same. Uh, and in a sense, that was a radical idea. But in a sense, this is really the principle behind a lot of what moral systems that we recognize as moral systems. The more controversial bit is this. They said, what really matters? And their conclusion is that happiness, or what you might call the overall quality of experience, is what really matters. And again, I don't like using, I was talking about this at dinner, I don't like using the word happiness for this, because when you say happiness, you think about things like, oh, hot fudge sundaes, and things like that. They didn't mean that in terms of the things that put smiles on your face. What they meant by happiness is the quality of people's experience, which includes all positive and negative experience. And the experience is the common is, is the common moral currency. Now, how do they come to that conclusion? I think one way to one line of argument, I think the one that's most compelling goes like this: you start with anything that you care about, and then keep asking, why do you care about that until you run out of answers? So you say, Oh, well, you went to work today. Why'd you go to work? Well, I like going to work. I also need to earn money. Why do you need money? Well, I have to pay the rent. Why do you need the rent? Well, I need a place to stay. Why do you need a place to stay? Well, you know, I, I gotta sleep somewhere. Why do you need to sleep somewhere? Why can't you sleep outside? Well, it's cold outside. What's wrong with being cold? Well, it's painful. Well, what's wrong with pain? It's just bad, right? And that's when you sort of get to the end, right? The idea is that if you chase all of those value chains until you can chase it no more, you ultimately come down to your choices about improving the quality of your own experience or improving the quality of somebody else's experience. Now, that's a controversial argument. Not everybody buys it, but at least you can see the rationale for it. And if you put these two answers together, everybody matters equally, and the quality of people's experience, which we'll just call happiness is what matters, then you get this dictum to maximize happiness impartially. And the cool thing is that no matter what tribe you're in, you care about your own happiness, and you care about the happiness of at least some people. No matter what tribe you're in, you don't like sleeping out in the cold. And you like having a nice warm meal when you're, when, when, when you're hungry. And you want the same for the people that you care about, and so on and so forth. And so I think the essence of their idea was not that they necessarily came up with the moral truth, but they found something of value behind all these other values that's shared across people who may have moral disagreements, that's shared across tribes. And I think that was really the genius of, of, of their philosophy, which is unfortunately known as utilitarianism. As I was saying, it, I refer to call it deep pragmatism, because I think that that's really what it is. It's saying, look, where is our common ground? What is the common currency behind the values we share? And how can we use that common currency to make trade-offs among competing values when we disagree? But the more modest takeaway is this, that sometimes we may think that we're having a moral insight. You say, oh, you have an obligation to save this guy who's bleeding on the side of the road. You must. But here, saving people on the other side of the world who you can save with your donation dollars, not so important. Well, maybe that's a moral insight about the nature of duty. That's what a lot of philosophers have thought. But maybe this is just our inflexible point and shoot tribal morality. This is just our biology or our culture saying, eh, those people over there, they don't really matter. What matters are the people who you interact with personally, especially your friends and your family, and especially yourself. And at the very least, I think a lesson that we can take from this is our gut reactions are not so reliable. Our point and shoot morality can be sensitive to things that upon reflection, that in manual mode, we realize don't really matter. Like, how far away is the person whose life I can save? And I think this is true for a lot of the moral issues that divide us. That is, we're relying on automatic settings that are not necessarily getting us at the moral truth, or not necessarily reflecting things that upon reflection, we would consider to be a, a valid basis for a moral decision. So, 
to put all of this together into a kind of uh, psychological moral prescription. Here's my, my modest advice for the world. When you're dealing with the morality of everyday life, me versus us, or me versus you, should you lie, should you cheat, should you steal, should you do less than your fair share of the work, should you put it into the kitty for, to pay for the roof, whatever it is, that's when you want to think fast. Our gut reactions are designed very well for solving the me versus us problem, the tragedy of the common. But when you're dealing with the tragedy of common sense morality, when it's not just about selfishness versus the moral thing to do, when it's about this group versus that group, this group's values versus that group's values, this group's interests versus that group's, that group's interests, that's when our gut reactions can't be relied upon because our gut reactions are what have us at each other's throats in the first place. And the only solution is to go into manual mode and to find some kind of common currency that we can use to decide, okay, which values are going to prevail here on the new pastures of the modern world. So that's the general idea. Thanks for your attention, and thank you to the people who made a lot of this research possible and the people who actually did it. And I uh, look forward to your questions. starts it, but then it works its way into our automatic. 